we got JMH going? Oh. Rudy, do we have the other youth going? Are there any here? <laughs> Two. Y'all need to look around and see you don't see any text. Them. Where are you? You text my family. <laughs> Actually, sisters arrived this evening. Their sisters and nieces and nephews. So they received them back at the house. <clears throat> we do have a light night tonight. Welcome to summer, right? A lot of folks traveling and doing different things here over the next several weeks. So be praying for people as they travel and take much needed vacations. Ran into Tammy this morning. I had to swing by Dr. Austin's office where she works. And she's getting ready to head out to Hawaii tomorrow for two weeks. So. Awesome trip back there to see family, so we're joking around, praying that she actually comes back. <laughs> I expect to see you in two weeks. So, uh, anyhow, good stuff. Well, how's everybody doing tonight? We good? How was your trip? It was wonderful. Yeah? Yeah. We yeah. Play Jesus. It was just so awesome. Awesome. Yeah? Very good. Very good. Glad to hear that. Okay, well, we are going to continue to search the scriptures this evening as it relates to the topic of prayer. Who needs one of the prayer outlines? Yeah, okay, you've got a couple there. You, need, you guys need one? Raise your hand high, it's okay. You don't need to be ashamed. Unless this is like your fourth one, then you need to be ashamed. <laughs> All right. Let's see, there was more than two, more than two people that needed one. All right. There you go. All right. <clears throat> Before we jump in, a couple of announcements this evening. Uh, to just I didn't mark your calendars for be anticipating. So this Sunday, don't miss it. We have child dedication this Sunday. We've got baptism. Uh, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 4, just verses 11 and 12 this Sunday. I think it fits perfectly with baptism and child dedication. Uh, so it's going to just be a great time of celebration. We're going to have some awesome worship. Um, just going to be a great time of uh, just being together and celebrating those who are, uh, well, we'll be celebrating new life and new life in Christ for those who are uh, making a profession of faith through baptism. So be here to support your brothers and sisters in Christ in that way. It'll be a great Sunday morning. And then uh, Tuesday night, we've got Providence House Outreach, uh, Providence Home. Uh, we will not be doing a dinner Tuesday evening. We'll just be doing the chapel service. So that'll be at 645. So anybody who wants to join us at Providence Home, that's men and women, even though it's a men's home, uh, men and women uh, can come and be a part of that. Uh, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to the men there. Uh, David and Nathan will be leading some uh, time of worship that evening, and then uh, I'll be leading the chapel service at 6.45. So those that want to carpool will leave from the church Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. I believe also that is the first night for the ladies' new book study, so I know that there's a little bit of a conflict there, which is fine. Uh, so ladies, if you're involved in the book study that kicks off on Tuesday evening, uh, that is great to be a part of that. Sounds like... You're going to have to maybe meet in the sanctuary to make that thing happen with the number of ladies that are participating. So that's pretty awesome. I'm sorry? For the ladies? Shannon? 630? 630, 8.30. So, uh, so men, if you're not watching little, well, even if you are watching the kids, forget that. It's not an excuse. Bring the kids, okay? You can be here. You can come with me down to Providence Home, and then we'll be back as the ladies are wrapping up the study. See how that works? Uh, so come on out for that. Then we got Hannah House next week as well for the ladies. That's on Thursday evening. Time for that? Anybody? We meet there between 6 30 and 7. Yeah, they're at the new house. They're back downtown. So you don't have to drive all the way out to Lexington. We're going to get back to you. Six. Six o'clock. Okay, sorry, I can never remember that. Um, and then one date that you need to put on your calendars is Friday, July 19th. Write it down. Put it in there. Okay. Those thumbs working. Friday, July 19th, 6 to 8 o'clock. We're having a pig picking. Uh, we call that around here? Pig picking? Anybody? Anybody? Pick, pick off of a pig? Pig picking? Pig picking. No? Barbecue? Barbecue. Okay. 
just say barbecue. <laughs> Where do they say pig picking? Michigan. In Michigan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. We're going to have barbecue, uh, pork, chicken, sides, and uh, this will become an annual event. This is going to be a 10th uh, hour project barbecue fundraiser. So every year when we do this, all the proceeds will go to either support those who we are sending from the church to participate in the 10th hour project, this year being Tara. <laughs> Woo! Uh, but every year, if we're not sending anybody that year, then we'll just send another student from another church or support the ministry, however. So uh, this will become an annual summer event is our goal. And so we'll be right out here in front of the church. We're going to close off the parking lot. We'll have games, fellowship, um, and Reggie and Bobby. And I don't know if anybody else is getting in on that in terms of the cooking. Um, but it's sure to be a great evening. And uh, we're going to pre-sell tickets, I think, uh, just so at least we can get a rough head count. Uh, there will be food above and beyond that. But um, pre-sell tickets and then take a love offering that evening for those who feel so led to just help support that ministry. And, uh, and again, this year, Tara, who's heading out. So, get it on your calendar. You don't want to miss it. All Six right. O'clock. Six o'clock. Yep. Anybody who follows Pastor Bobby on Instagram? I don't. But uh, Michael, I know you do too. Uh, you know that he's going to grill something pretty awesome because I hear whatever he grills, you can see it on Instagram. Yeah. So and just Facebook. go check it out. It's Bobby Flav, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you can see his culinary specialties and get excited for that, uh, for that event. So. All right, we better stop. All right, we good? Are we ready to get the word? Are we talking about prayer? Okay. On the topic of prayer, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., our prayer gathering, third week. Third week of our 6 a.m. prayer gathering. For those that are really spiritual, you'll be here at 6 a.m., right? Uh, the one who is there at 6 a.m. is laughing right now, right? <laughs> uh, no, I jest. I say it in jest. But honestly, if you do, it's tough. It's tough to get out of bed and or wherever, you know, whatever you're doing. For Rusty, it's like, well, 6 a.m., come on. I've been at work for four hours already, right? Um, but it has proven to be a sweet time of fellowship and just an opportunity to really be diligent and just seeking the Lord in prayer. So if you feel so inclined, we'll be here tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., uh, continuing that uh, routine now of being in prayer together because we know that prayer is in fact a blessing, right? Prayer is a blessing. As we see here uh, on our outline by way of quick review, prayer is a blessing of salvation. It's a means of grace, of unmerited favor. This is a way in which God has said, you don't, you don't deserve it, but I'm giving you this. In fact, I've made a way for this, for you to boldly enter the throne room and, and to come before the throne of grace and seek me and seek that I would move and that I would work. And so we have two primary means of grace. One is the word of God. This is a treasure for us. It, it, it should be just that. We're going to talk about that on Sunday morning in Hebrews uh, 4, 11, and 12. We're going to talk about the word of God, what a gift this is. The only book in the history of all creation that is indeed living and active and powerful, sharper than a two-edged than a two-edged sword, right? This is a powerful book, and it's one of the means of grace by which God has given us a gift to say, this is how uh, you can learn, this is how I will direct your paths, this is how I will lead you and guide you by the power of my spirit, and then he's given us prayer. And prayer is often underutilized. Prayer is a tool in our toolbox that we don't often take out. We only bring it out oftentimes in sort of this last-ditch effort when we say, I've tried everything else, and now I just need to pray. Or we say it in ways where it's like, all we can do at this point is pray. That's all we can do. Because in our minds, we've exhausted everything else. It's the only thing left that we can possibly do. When in fact, before we did anything to begin with, it should be prayer. It should be being on our knees before the Lord seeking Him. And so prayer is a struggle. Prayer is a struggle because... Uh, we, we, as you see there, even under reasons we fail to pray, the four reasons there, and, and for those that have new outlines, you haven't filled these in yet, number one is a lack of faith. But a lack of faith that prayer will even work. Right? Maybe there's been times when we've prayed in the past and we felt like our prayer wasn't answered. Maybe there's times we thought for sure God was going to do something and He didn't, and we prayed about it, and we think, oh, I don't even know. I don't even know, Lord, if, if prayer is, are you even hearing me? And so we struggle with believing that prayer will work. Uh, secondly, there we, we, we fail to pray because of a lack of familiarity. 
because we don't have an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and so we struggle to be able to even talk to somebody we really don't even feel like we know. We struggle sometimes to pray because of a lack of focus, because of distractions all around us, and, and because we've not been diligent in going into that secret place, going into our prayer closet and seeking Him and, and continuing in prayer and being diligent in prayer, but, and not sort of being uh, distracted or led astray by all the other things that may be going on around us. And we struggle sometimes to pray because of a lack of, of form. And, and once again, I'll emphasize, as I have every time on that point, that it's not about that you have to have some perfect prayer. But there is an understanding that we can have in prayer. The disciples themselves asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he did. He answered that question. It was something that Jesus thought was a good question, evidently, because he said, when you pray, pray in this manner. And he gave us a pattern for prayer. And so there is a way that we can approach the Lord rightly in prayer. And we need to understand that. Prayer is a blessing, and we need to take advantage of it. And I think, inherently, as, as believers, we sort of say, yes, prayer is important, but does that translate to actually praying? Does that translate to actually following through? As it says here on your outline, prayer doesn't need more proof. It needs more practice. That's how we're going to continue to pray. And so by doing things like having First Wednesday prayer by uh, beginning our studies with prayer by having 6 a.m. prayer gatherings. We're providing the opportunity and saying it's important that we continue in prayer, that we practice it over and over again. Okay. And so this, this effort here as we continue to make our way through this outline, this is, this is searching the scripture to see what do the scriptures have to say about prayer. And we saw at the very beginning of this that prayer is, is more than a blessing. Prayer is commanded. Prayer is commanded. Do you see the various scripture references there? It's not just that prayer is suggested. It's not just that prayer is a good idea. It's that the Bible says pray. Pray often. Men everywhere ought to always pray. Prayer, we see, is more powerful than earthly weapons. As we see in the example of Ezra, Ezra who had besought the, the king to be able to go back to the homeland and to rebuild the temple and said that God's hand will be upon us, we will be okay essentially, and I paraphrase, and all of a sudden they know that the, the, the foreign armies are gathering around them and, and the men are beginning to worry and fear and the reality is they're thinking we need weapons, we need chariots, we need horses, we're about to have to go into battle here, but Ezra had the wherewithal to say, if I go back to the king, who I said, God has given us this plan, God has told us that this is what we were supposed to do, we'll be okay, he will provide for us, he'll take care of us. If I go back to him and say, hey, we need some help, well, then my testimony, my witness is blown. And so what did they do? They, they fell to their knees and they prayed. They prayed that God would move and that God would work. And so prayer, we know, is more powerful than earthly weapons. Prayer is more important than food. In sleep, we see Jesus as the greatest example of this, of one who had risen early on a regular basis and would go out early in the morning, would go out into a solitary place and, and seek the Father. And this is Jesus. This is the Son of God. And clearly, it was important for Him to pray. In fact, He often said that He, he would do only that which was the will of the Father. And how did He know that but to pray, to seek the Lord? Prayer is more important than food and sleep. Prayer is more important than preaching or whatever the mission is that we see there in Acts. And we see it several times uh, through Acts as well as in, uh, excuse me, uh, in Acts chapter 6, chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 13. As we see the foundation of the early church there that consistently over and over again before they went out, before they took action, before they went and, and, and did anything, that they first prayed, they first prayed sought the Lord, and it was clear that He directed their paths. And then we began to make our way into the nature of prayer, point number two. And this is where we saw that when asked, Lord, teach us to pray, that this was a request that was in accordance with His will as Jesus answered in a familiar passage there in Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, with what we know as the Lord's Prayer, but... As we've often said, it's more the disciples' prayer than it is the Lord's prayer. Because it was the disciples who asked. It was the disciples who wanted to know, how do we pray? And it was Jesus who instructed them in that. And so as we make our way now into what we uh, jumped into last time, if you would, just agree with me in prayer again as we continue. Father, we pause here this evening, Lord, and as we consider once again that question that your disciples 
the apostles, Lord, ask you, how ought we to pray? Lord, may that be our hearts here this evening as well. I'm not suggesting, Lord, that we've never prayed uh, or that everyone here, Lord, struggles in prayer. But, Lord, I think it would be right for us all to have a greater understanding of what your word has to say about prayer, about this amazing tool, this amazing weapon, this incredible opportunity that we have to commune with the creator of the universe. Father, we would not take lightly, nor would we be flippant with our approach in prayer, but that we would take very seriously this gift that we've been given that's made possible to us by you, Lord Jesus, and your work upon the cross. For it's through your death and resurrection that the veil was torn, giving us access into the Holy of Holies. And as your word says in the letter to the Hebrews, that we might boldly approach the throne of grace. And so, Father, we do that here now. We boldly come before you. We ask that you'd move and you'd work here this evening, that you'd speak to us and teach us. As we search your scriptures, they come alive to us in a way that only your word can. And that through our study this evening, we leave uh, having greater knowledge of you and what it is that you desire of us, especially in the area of prayer. And that we seek you more diligently each day moving forward, Lord. So, Father, we love you and praise you. We give you thanks for this tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there we see the, the, this, this model prayer. And, and, and what was that prayer? Say it along with me. Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. John. That's the Lord's Prayer. Slight variations, depending on the translation that you memorize, right? Did Jesus say, always pray this prayer? No, he didn't. And I won't be too redundant on this point, as I've mentioned it before. A lot of times people take this, right, and they just adopt this as their prayer. And they think, okay, we can just recite this over and over again. And while certainly you can pray that prayer, I think there's a time and a place where it may seem right to pray that prayer. What we need to take more from it is, is less the prayer itself and more the pattern that Jesus gave, the manner in which he told us to pray, which includes, uh, or at least begins with this idea of, of adoration, right? It begins at the very beginning with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It begins with praise, and that's where we see in letter B there that prayer is adoration. Prayer is adoration. How often do we come to the Lord in prayer and we say, Heavenly Father, Lord, I need this. I need this now. We come, to, we come to God the Father oftentimes as if he has a big white beard, a red suit, and he'll take a picture with you on his lap, right? He is not Santa Claus. He's not who we come to with our list of wants and desires, although we can come to him with those things, and there's a time and a place for those things, and our God is so loving and so gracious that he wants to know those things, and even when we come to him with that, and that alone, I think oftentimes he, he moves and he works, but the reality is if we pray in the way that Jesus taught us how to pray, we're going to begin with praise. Furthermore, it doesn't say prayer is adoration when everything in your life is just wonderful. That you can praise me when everything's going right for you. No, it doesn't say that at all. There's no qualifier there. There's no caveat. It means when we go to the Lord, yes, we boldly approach the throne, but we come before the throne and we praise Him. Now, why should we praise Him? Well, he's worthy of our praise, is he not? Yes. But there should even be a sense of fear there. A healthy fear, a reverence, exactly. We talked about that last time. Listen, if you really have a sense of what's happening, and sometimes this is a thing, right? We can become so comfortable in prayer even that we forget who we're talking to. Gone for us are the, the, the idea of this Old Testament God who would strike a man down for the slightest infraction. It's still the same God. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go into prayer with fear and trembling, thinking at any moment a lightning bolt has just got to dick me out. Right? But there should be a sense of God. I'm coming before a holy and righteous God who has saw fit to redeem me, to snatch me from the depths of hell, and, and, and to set me on a path towards eternal life with Him forever. Lord, that is amazing. No matter what is going on in your life, there is always the opportunity to praise Him, and we should. From there, we see that prayer is not just adoration, but prayer is confession. 
And so once again, we haven't even yet gotten to the, the requests, oftentimes the, the big part of why we're praying. I mean, how often do you pray and you just pray to bring praise and to bring confession? That can be, that can be a, a thorough prayer time when you haven't even interceded for anybody else. You haven't even brought things that you've needed before him. It's just a time to praise him. In fact, if you think about it, if we're taking seriously our praise and worship on Sunday mornings or on Wednesday evening, that's not just a time of singing. That can be part of your prayer life. If Paul prayed without ceasing, and there were times when they gathered together and sang hymns, if we see the disciples chained up in prison and they're singing songs, they weren't just singing songs. It wasn't just, hey, I heard this catchy song on the radio and I can't get it out of my head. It's just, it's just there, so let's sing because it sounds good. No, they're singing to God. They're praising Him. And it's in prayer, right? You can sing in your prayer time. In fact, I love it when I'm in prayer time with people. And it hasn't happened that often in our prayer gatherings. And part of that is just sort of form and function, right? But, but I suspect it too more so in these 6 a.m. prayer gatherings where someone just begins to sing. They just begin to sing. Because that's how they're so moved by the Spirit in this time of prayer is to, be, is, is to bring Him praise, to bring Him adoration. And then this next part of, pre, of, of confession. And listen... Confession, we know, is oftentimes, oh Lord, there is sin in my life. Sometimes it is right that we need to confess some things very specifically. And, and we know we need to bring those things to the Lord. And it is also good sometimes for us to bring those things to a Christian brother or sister. Right, for that accountability. Okay? But as we pray together, confession doesn't necessarily need to be, here is my deep, dark, secret sin. But what, what are the things that are going on in my life? We had a time of, uh, some time of confession even during our last uh, gathering the week before last. Or, or some people shared a little bit about just, man, you know what, my heart is hard towards this. Or I've been struggling in this way. You see, as, as, we, as we go from praise and then into confession, we've got to get ourselves right with this holy and righteous God that we've brought our praises, that we've, brought our, uh, that we've honored and glorified and say. Lord, here's some things in my life. But not just in our own lives, as we saw, especially in the example of Daniel, is Daniel was in a constant habit of confession, but less so for his own sin, but for the sin of the people, that he really took upon himself and, and took it as his own failure, that his people were sinning in this way, and that he should be doing something about it. And so sometimes our confession, too, can be on the behalf of others, Right? And so prayer, as we consider the manner in which the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, uh, is adoration, it's confession, and now we see as we're caught up where we were last time to letter D, prayer is communion. Prayer is communion. And so I'd ask here, and I want to hear some pages turning, is anybody at Exodus 25, 22 yet? Or when you get there, go ahead and read it out for all the world to hear. Exodus 25, 22. And then I will meet with you. Then I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. And there I will meet with you. Way, where is the, what's being referred to there? Where's, where's, the, where's the there? You know it, don't be shy. Say that again. It was, but if it was, what was it above? Above the mercy seat between the cherubim. What is that? Hmm? Well, that's, you're right. You're, you're, you're <laughs> as a future throne room, but specifically what's being described in this case here. The mercy seat, the cherubim, Come on. What is it? The ark. This is the top of the ark. Okay? The ark of the covenant is the mercy seat. You've got the cherubim on either end, and they kind of come up and they form this. And that is where the Lord, the presence of the Lord, would meet with who? The priest. Where was it stored? In the Holy of Holies which at this particular time was not in a temple, but was in a what? The, tent, the tabernacle, right? It's not until Solomon. Remember, I, I often, when I, when I hear about uh, the priest and the functioning of the priest, even think of um, 
uh, Samuel and the call of Samuel when he's there ministering. That's in the tabernacle, right? This is in the tent, the tent of meeting. Uh, the, the temple itself didn't come, we you know, until Solomon. David had the vision for it, but he wasn't able to complete it and, and build it, and, and Solomon did that. So this is in the tabernacle. This is where God is meeting with the high priest to meet with them and to confer with them. Now, up to this point, Moses is the one who did that, but God gives Moses the plans for how to implement all of this. Right? And, and, and so Moses enlists Aaron and begins to raise up the priests, and all of this stuff begins to be set in order. But as we think about prayer being communion, so if this is what is occurring, if God is meeting with the high priest here in the Holy of Holies, well, what happens when Jesus is resurrected? There you go. It's a, it a bit more powerful than that. I like that. It's more <laughs> There's this earthquake that happened, Don't and the veil's so torn. Cool. Which way is the veil torn? Vertical. Top to bottom, right? For them, it was, it was really indicative of there's no man who could have come in here. And, and furthermore, it, it's not like it was just a cheap shower curtain, okay? This thing was, this thing was thick, okay? Now, I mention that to, because that's the symbolism for us, that, that that veil was torn, giving us access to essentially this place, okay? Now... It's, it's, it's different, of course, today. Wendy earlier said this is the throne room of heaven, and indeed it, it is. The, everything in the tabernacle, and, and after this, I'm thinking we'll probably do a study of the tabernacle and then a study of the temple, um, to, just to give us an idea, really, of the significance of each of these things. And, and it wasn't just some tent that they threw up out there, right? There was, there was order to it. Okay? All of those things are a picture of the throne room of heaven. Okay? And, and so for us, as we think about prayer being communion, to hear God say, I will meet with you in this place, to us should be an encouragement that in prayer we meet with God. We meet with Him in that place. That's incredible. And, and honestly, and I don't mean to say this in a judgmental way, but when, when, you, when you sort of consider the weight of that, if that doesn't sort of give you chills then that's something that you need to take to the Lord in prayer. It really is. If that is something that just sort of falls on you as sort of like, okay, yeah, that's kind of cool. It needs to be more than that. It really does. You, you need to pray, Lord, help me to understand the gravity and the weight of, of, of such a gift, of such a promise. When we say that, that, that prayer is one of two blessings of salvation, two means of grace, unmerited favor, something that is the Word of God and prayer, that God would give us these things, that the idea of being able to commune with God the Father in such a way should absolutely blow our mind. Okay? There's a second one, uh, Exodus 31, 18, if someone would read that. So the Lord spoke with Moses as a friend, face to face. Now, I've, I've shared before, I think as we went through this and we touched on that verse as part of our Through the, through the Word series, I long for such a relationship. Right? I mean, that, that is to me pretty incredible, and I won't pretend to, have, I won't sit here today and say, yeah. I mean, I kind of know the Lord the same way that Moses did, right? I wouldn't be so bold as to make such a claim. But the, just the, the idea of it gives me hope of continued intimacy with the Lord, that, that here was this man, Moses, and he conferred with the Lord as a friend. And, you know, I was listening to a, a, a teaching on my drive earlier today. Um, forgive me, I forget his name. This is actually the first time I've heard him specifically. Uh, but a Jewish believer, uh, he was talking about just how he came to saving faith in Christ, and it was through somewhat of a, a religious search of his where he was kind of dabbling in a lot of different things, just on this quest, and, and he encountered these believers who were just, just zealous for their faith, and the thing that was so profound to him that he just really struggled with was he said it was just so evident that these people had a relationship with God, that they talked to him as a friend, and he said... I, to me, it just, I, I didn't understand that, but, but I knew it. He said, I could see it. 
He said, I observed it in their lives. I witnessed it regularly as they prayed. And it began, that's what began to cause him to go, I want to know God in that way. And, and I believe that we can. When we pray, we are having a communion with God such that we can talk to him, yes, with reverence, but as one who is a friend. And I would encourage you tonight in your prayer life, do you have that kind of communion with him? I think there are different times and in, in, in different ways in which we should pray. That's evident through this entire study. That there's a time and a place for, for different ways in which we approach God that I think are often motivated by the heart that we possess at that time. You know, we'll get eventually to the idea of supplication, right? Supplication is one of those examples where it's like supplication is going to be different than just your sort of average prayer because supplication is almost a prayer of desperation. God, I need you, right? So there are different ways in which we sometimes approach the Lord, but do you ever come before the Lord and, just, and you're just sort of like, man, Lord, whether it's positive and you're just filled with joy and you're thinking, Lord, you're so good. That you can kind of talk to him as you would a friend that you're encouraging, that you're just saying, man, you, you're great. You're such a great friend. Or sometimes, Lord, I'm just, I'm struggling with this and I don't understand this. You know, in my, my own prayer life, uh, there are often times when I'm just thinking, Lord, I, I don't know right now. I'm a little confused. I don't entirely get this. Like, Lord, I've done this and I've done this. And I'm not suggesting, Lord, that you're not there. Far be it for me to suggest that. But God, I'm kind of waiting here. And if I'm an idiot, which I'm inclined to think I am, Lord, I know, and I'm a little thick-headed, but I, I could use a little something right now to kind of nudge me in the right direction, right? That's sometimes been a prayer of mine. And, and if somebody were to observe that, if somebody were to hear that, you'd think, he's talking to somebody he has a relationship with, probably, right? So when we have communion with God in this way, we should get to a place where it's, we're talking to somebody who we're familiar with. He's a friend of ours. How about Exodus 33, 11? You just said 33, 11? Can you go through 11, 18? Thank you. 31, 18. When he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written in the of God. Yeah. And so here's the account, right, where Moses is, uh, he's been up on Mount Sinai and he's getting ready to come back down. He's been given the, the, the tablets. And, you know, once again, here's a situation where there was time spent in seeking the Lord. There was time spent conversing with him, discussing with him. And then furthermore, what he took from there, and not that we're going to take something similar from our time with the Lord, but yet God speaks to us, right? We can go with a sense of confidence that he's, you know, he's directing us. If we, if we confer with him and commune with him in this way, and it just further reinforces the relationship that Moses had with him. Now, Moses was indeed a man who was called by God. who was used in a mighty and powerful way. Uh, I don't think it's wrong necessarily for us to think, man, I want to have a relationship like Moses had with the Lord. But Moses was also Israel's, really Israel's first prophet, right? And so it would be wrong to think, Lord, I want you to make me a prophet. You know, that's, no, that's, that's not going to happen right now. That's, that's not something that we're called to. Uh, but to look at that relationship and to say, Father, could you, could you show me how to develop that level of intimacy? Come to know you in that way. To speak to me in that way. <clears throat> Let's jump ahead to Romans chapter 8. And this one, and Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 27. So, if prayer is communion, 
And, and as we consider prayer being communion, we're encouraged with these examples of where there's just this incredible opportunity to confer with God in such an intimate way. Uh, there's this opportunity to develop a relationship with God where, similar to Moses, we speak with him as a, as a friend. Uh, I think, too, even as I consider, Lord, okay, I, I long for that. I desire that. I'd love to know what that is like. But yet, Lord, even as I pray, to give you the example that I gave you, there's times when it's just like, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling right now. And not just with, Lord, I don't know where to go or what to do, but sometimes maybe you get to that place where you go, Lord, I don't even know what to pray right now. You ever been there? You ever been there? Not, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what to pray. I don't even know how to pray right now. The, the situation is so far beyond me, Lord. And, and, and this is the cool thing. Is this is prayer. Right? This is communion with God. But you're just kind of telling Lord, I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and the amazing thing is here in Scripture, we see likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's incredible. That's a gift right there. That's a great promise to say, listen, you don't even know what, you're, what you should be praying for. But the Spirit is praying for you. Jesus himself is interceding for you with the Father. And there's a few things we need to consider here, particularly as it relates to these groanings, which cannot be uttered two, twofold here. One, when you consider speaking in tongues, this is, this is, this is a, there's a direct correlation here to praying in tongues. Okay? And so for a lot of people, they struggle a little bit with well, what's the purpose of tongues. We see example of tongues in, in Scripture that was for the benefit of the group, that they were spoken out loud, and it was uh, done in a way where uh, others were able to hear it in their own language. Um, we also uh, recognize that, that if tongues are to be spoken out loud within a setting, that there should be an interpretation given, so that similarly, we can benefit from it. Uh, but then there is the tongues that are more of a secret thing. They are your prayer language. And I do believe that tongues uh, can be used in this way, that an individual who's been gifted with a prayer language, that that is a way in which they oftentimes pray, that the Spirit is making utterance, that uh, the Spirit is assisting them in praying for things that they don't even quite know how to pray for. Uh, but the other thing here is that independent of having a prayer language, is that even when you, you, don't, you don't have that prayer language, you don't pray in tongues, but you're still struggling with what to pray, you can have confidence that the Spirit is making intercession for you. Okay? And, and it says here, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, so this is the other incredible thing here, is that he who searches the hearts... He knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so he knows our hearts. He knows where we're at. The Holy Spirit working, Jesus himself interceding for us, and it's according to the will of God. So once again, that should give us confidence in the way in which he is praying for us. I mentioned the analogy before that if we if we could if we could hear Jesus in the next room over if we had a little you know a little ear hole into the room behind us and that happened to be the throne room of heaven where Jesus was interceding on our behalf and if I could put my ear up to the wall there and listen to Jesus interceding for me you better believe that at that moment I would feel absolutely invincible and here is Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior praying for me specifically interceding for me, I, I would feel as if there is nothing at all that I can't do. Of course, it's in accordance with His will. The, the crazy thing about us is, we go, well, but I can't hear it and I can't see it and I can't touch it. And so I'm just less moved or motivated by that, right? But the idea of, of some distance doesn't mean that that's not happening. It doesn't mean that that's not occurring. It doesn't mean that Jesus is not, in fact, interceding for us. He is. That's what his word says. So whether or not you can hear it in the room next to you doesn't mean it's not happening. Furthermore, it's not as if Jesus is there sort of kneeling at the foot of God the Father and sort of just tossing up a prayer too, saying, man, I, I really think that this is what they need right now. And if you think that, and I hope, and 
I pray. No, he's praying in accordance with the will of God because he is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you better believe that what Jesus is interceding for is in direct accordance with the will of God. And so you can have confidence that your Lord and Savior is praying the will of God over your life. So then, think about that. Think about the, the amazing fact that your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is, is praying the will of God over your life, interceding for you. And now, read verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Even continue on in verse 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Praise God for that. Now, if you read that verse and you go, oh, he said predestination. And that scares me. It makes me uneasy and uncomfortable. We better get comfortable with it. Because we can't. Do I believe in predestination? Absolutely. Because it's in the Bible. It's scriptural. It's there. You can't avoid it. Any attempt to is just foolishness. It doesn't, however, mean all the other things that sometimes we feel like it means when you consider all sorts of other stuff, like five point Calvinism and all that. He did predestine. What this should what this should communicate to you when you read this is a confidence that he is praying for me, that when I don't know how to pray, the Spirit is, is making utterance on my behalf, that the Lord Jesus is interceding on behalf of me, and it's in accordance with the will of God, and, and that his plan will be carried out, that he, he knows the very beginning, he knows the end, what he's begun, he's going to finish, that, that in essence, and I know this is easier said than done, that there isn't a thing in this world that I have to worry about. God has got it. He's going to care for me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to see me through this until the very end. Now, here's the thing, and this is where you go, okay, now you jumped off the Reformation track here, right? That I believe that he needs our cooperation in this. And that's where man's free will comes into play. And so, yes, I do believe that we uh, have some responsibility in this, and we're not going to go into a lesson into how all that works here tonight. But here, think, and, and now, within this train of thought, then, this entire chapter should start to make more sense than as you even continue on in verse 31. What, sh what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Absolutely amen. Right? And so think back then to Sunday. Think back to Hebrews chapter 4 and entering his rest. This is how we enter his rest. It's through a study of the Word of God, but it's understanding, it's coming to an understanding of who God is and how He functions and how He operates. Right? To where we come to a place where we can enter His rest because we know He's got it. And if Carlos were sitting in here, if we were in Jamaica, he'd say, no worries, man. Right? If we were in the Northeast, we'd say, forget about it. Right? <laughs> You go wherever you want to go. There's a phrase that connects to this. That the, the, the point is to tell you, just relax. Right? Just relax. God's got it. Prayer is communion. And so do you see that this type of relationship, this understanding, is something that's sort of at work and on display in prayer. How incredible is that? 
what's even more just disappointing in my own life is how I can go, man, Lord, why haven't I prayed more? Why haven't I spent more time here? With all the different struggles and trials and the, the, the striving and the anxiety and all these different things, but to just go, Lord, you can come back to this. To trust in you and know you've got this. So prayer is adoration. It's, it's an aspect of praise. Prayer is confession. It's saying, Lord, here's the things in my life. Here's the things, that, those around me, Lord, that I need to take responsibility for. Prayer is communion. It's this opportunity to have this sweet intimacy and fellowship with the Lord. And then prayer, letter E, is thanksgiving. You see, we still haven't gotten yet to the requests. We still haven't gotten yet to our list of things. Because here prayer is thanksgiving. And what a wonderful thing when we come to Him in praise, where we, where we magnify His name, where we... Hallowed be thy name, where we give him the glory and the honor that he's due. When we come to him, we say, Lord, oh, here's the things in my life, Lord, that I know have been an issue of not pleasing to you, Lord. I, I give this to you. I confess this to you. And, and you come to this place where then you have this sweet intimacy with the Lord, and now you come to a place of, of true thanksgiving. And I think it's in this order, it's in this pattern, that we can truly come to a place of thanksgiving. Because after reading all of that, are you not sort of in a place of going, man, Lord, I am so thankful for who you are. For what you have done. For what you've accomplished. For what you're going to do. The first one here, Exodus 15. That's 18 verses. I'm not going to ask anybody to read all 18 verses. When he was ready. He's going to read it. But what we have in those 18 verses is the Song of Moses. This is the Song of Moses. <clears throat> Why was he singing? Yeah. You better sing when something like that happens, right? And it wasn't just the crossing of the Red Sea. That was just sort of the final act of this whole sort of section. It, I mean, it began with just everything that happened with the plagues and Pharaoh's heart and, 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 and then leaving and being chased and seeing God stop them and then seeing them swallowed up because they had just crossed over on dry ground. So much more. I mean, we can't even begin to even sort of imagine what it would have been like to have endured the time of slavery that they endured and then to see their miraculous delivery. And so, yes, it's right that they would sing. And, but throughout here, at the very beginning, he says, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. He has thrown into the sea the riders, right? The Lord is my strength in song. And so throughout Moses' song, it's thanksgiving and praise to the Lord for what He has done. Right? So it's continued uh, praise, but it's thanksgiving for how the Lord has moved, for how the Lord has worked. How often, and, 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 be, and be serious about this and considering, how often in your prayer life are you truly thanking Him for what He has done? And forgive me, you know, please don't misunderstand this, because I, I by no means intend to minimize His work of salvation but it's easy for us in prayer to go, well, Lord, thank you for saving me, right? Thank you for your son. Thank you. It's easy for us to sort of thank him and, and sort of lay out the gospel story. But if I put you on the spot like I often do and say, what are our praises tonight? Do you have those praises? Because sometimes we look for those praises as this big answer to prayer, this thing I've been waiting on for a long time. And yeah, absolutely. Praise Him when He answers something that's been on your heart for a long time, when He delivers you from something. But do we have an awareness of God's goodness, His grace, and His mercy on a daily basis? It's like, I can give you 20 things I'm thankful for that the Lord has done today. And when I say that, I speak to myself as well, because sometimes I'm just as stubborn in that way. Give thanks to the Lord. In Psalm, who has Psalm 95 too? We're just in Psalm 95 the past two Sundays. Look at the word does that. Yeah. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Shout joyfully to him with song. There's 
somebody who oftentimes after a service on Sunday says, man, I wanted to just shout out at one point. You know, a couple times. And I'm like, well, you know, don't scream. But just yell. And she scares somebody. But I'm like, shout it out. You got an amen? Say an amen. Right? Come before him with thanksgiving. We need to come to him with a, a heart that's a thankful, a heart of gratitude. And, and to shout joyfully to him with psalms. And that brings in again that idea of singing praises. And so in your prayer time, it's a good thing to, to sing. Or, to, as, I, as I've said before, there's no plagiarism in prayer. Take one of the psalms. Take one of the psalms. I mean, when we prayed last Thursday uh, during our 6 a.m. prayer, and I, and, and I was bringing the time of prayer to a close, and quite honestly, I thought, well, I, don't, I don't really know how to close this thing out. Uh, perfect example, Lord, I really don't know how to pray at this point. I want to be encouraging. And so I turned to the psalm. And man, I don't know. Maybe it was just me, but that left me feeling charged up at the end because it's his word. Because we did what he told us to do, to, to, to shout joyfully to him with psalms. And so go to the psalms. Pray the psalms. Right? You know, and, and on Sunday as we closed out, you know, what the Lord led me to pray was from Ephesians chapter 3. Not, not a prayer of my own words, but to say there is a prayer in Scripture that the Apostle Paul prays, and I think that's for us right now, and to pray that. What Ephesians 5.20? Go for it. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah. What verse is that? What are we told there? Here's a great example because you read it in verse 19. This is what we call the one another ministries, right? 59 times throughout the New Testament, we see one another in various contexts. Here we see that one another in terms of speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, this doesn't mean, right, that we're in sort of some big musical. I went to see Aladdin. I was like, hey, I think this is going to be good. I remember the other Aladdin. Will Smith is in this one. Which, how crazy is this? Because my kids were like, who's Will Smith? I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean, who's Will Smith? And they're like, well, who's Will Smith? And then I started to look at all of his movies, and I'm like, oh, you really know who Will Smith is? Man, I feel old all of a sudden. So now Alexis is asking, can I watch The Fresh Prince? And I was like, I think. <laughs> but I've thought before, and I've gone back to those shows, and I'm like, wait a second. Anyhow, I digress. But the boys, this was my point. I'm like, yeah, let's go see Aladdin. And Alexis is like, yeah, let's go see Aladdin. And the boys were sort of hesitant. Uh, I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? I think there's a lot of singing in it, Dad. Oh, <laughs> you think it's a musical, huh? Well, it sort of was. But afterwards, they were like, yeah, I like it. You know? <laughs> it was pretty good. Life doesn't have to be some big musical where we break out into song when it doesn't really make sense to Okay? This isn't necessarily commanding that, but this speaks to an attitude of praise. This speaks to joy. This speaks to our interactions with one another. It is the communication we have with one another comparative to, to songs? Is it filled with joy? Is it encouraging? When we sing, it should bring joy to people. It, it, when we sing, it should be focused on something in terms of our praise, right? Is that our attitude with one another? Are we, are we leading people to this? Are we encouraging one another? Are we making melody in our hearts to the Lord and encouraging others to do the same? From there then, giving thanks sometimes when things are going well, right? No, it says giving thanks always. We know that. Give me thanks always for some things, all, all, all things, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another, there's another one another 
in the fear of God, submitting to one another. Okay, this is describing uh, our relationships with one another, and, and it's marked by a constant attitude of thanksgiving towards the Lord. Okay, there's never a time when there's not something that we have the opportunity to thank Him for. And we see that in Colossians 4, 2, continuing earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Prayer is thanksgiving. Okay, 24, we got time for this one. Letter F, prayer is petition. Okay. So now... After adoration, after confession, after communion, after thanksgiving, now we start to make our way into petition. What is petition? Yeah, exactly right. This is where we ask, okay? This is where we ask. Someone read for me Daniel chapter 2, verse 17. And if we continue to read that, if we went all the way down through verse 23, what we would see there would be the prayer that Daniel would lift up to the Lord. And what is he praying for? Yeah. Yep. So earlier we know that he had purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the portion of the king. But then what starts to happen here... Um, What was happening right there in the end of the chapter prior to that? Yeah. So guess what happens? Right? Daniel goes back, it says, to tell his friends that what? So, hey, <laughs> I kind of said that I'd interpret the king's dream. And we need to ask the Lord to give us that interpretation. Right? So his roommates... His besties are probably like, dude, it's already hard enough living here, right? You had to go, what? <clears throat> no, it's okay. It's okay. All right? So then they bow, they bow down before him. And look how they start their prayer. Verse 20. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. <laughs> That was an effective prayer. Okay? Now, James 5.16 says, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If there were ever a righteous man that we see in Scripture, Daniel was one, because we don't have an example of Daniel's sin even in Scripture. Again, not to suggest that he didn't sin, but the way Scripture records it is, if there's a righteous guy who didn't do a whole lot wrong, it was this guy. And I see in his prayer here that what? As it relates to his requests... It was stated that they needed to seek the Lord for this particular thing. And he did say, uh, uh, what we have asked of you there at the end. But as we read his prayer, I don't even really see where he asked much. Do you? What did he do? He praised him. Might that mean that God has a pretty good idea? Of what he needed. Right? Yet I gotta be like, Lord, you see, here's what's happening. You know? And this, and this, and then this. And if this doesn't happen, then this is what's gonna happen. And, and then this, and this, and this, and the whole while you gotta think like, God's going, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Kinda know all that. It's a whole omniscience thing. 
omnipresence, beginning, end, I created you, right? Kind of doing all this, right? Yeah, but, 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 I got to and I love it because it's happening to me with my own kids, right? The boys especially. God bless them. No, but, but, okay, continue. Is it, and then this, and that, and that. Oh, okay, yeah, right? And, and what a wonderful picture it is of me <laughs> going to my father and wanting to do that very thing. But the point here being, they praised him. Listen, what I'm telling you right now is, is, is everything that you need, he knows. He knows what you have need of even before you ask. Now, does he want you still to ask? Yes. Biblically, it says that too, that we should ask. But sometimes the ask can be as simple as that. Feel free to spend all your time in praising him and to have the confidence then to go, Lord, you know what I have need of. And I'm trusting you to meet that need. Because you are awesome. Right? What an incredible example to us of sometimes what that ask looks like. What do we see elsewhere there in Daniel, in, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 16 through 19? Oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray. Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of Now, Daniel 9, 16 through 19 could probably move into that next category, which is prayer is supplication. He even calls it a supplication here, right? But I think it kind of meets both. If we look at just sort of the front end, we see there is a request. And, and there's a principle here that Daniel is asking. Whereas before, Daniel simply praised the Lord and very simply asked. Uh, here we see a much more specific ask. And so we see both in Scripture. It's not to suggest that there aren't times when we should make a very specific ask of the Lord. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily come with some long, drawn-out explanation, but simply, here's what I'm seeking, Lord. This is specifically what I'm asking for. And as the prayer continues, there's definitely a sense, as I stated already, a sense of his supplication here, that it moves not necessarily to a place of desperation, but you can hear it here as you read it in his voice where he's crying out. He's crying out to God, and that's what happens when we move to a place of supplication where it's less about, Lord, I'm asking that you would do this or that in my life or in this person's life, which would be intercession, but that it comes to this place of, oh God, I need you. We need you, Lord. And, and here, too, this, this ask is rooted in an understanding of who God is. And I don't believe Daniel here is trying to trap the Lord, as it were, but he, in confidence, boldly approaching that throne, if you will, is stating the character of the Lord. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. And so here he appeals to the fact that, that God is, is good and uh, that God would so move in this situation. And so sometimes... Uh, you know, our ask may look a little different, but God does indeed want us to ask. And we close on this verse here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Someone would read that.
So what do we see? This is, of course, the words of Jesus here. What is he telling us? Now, does this mean that anything we ask for of him, he's going to give us? This is where you need to study your whole Bible. <laughs> right? Don't take just one verse, okay? Because elsewhere we see that we need to ask according to what? His will. Exactly right. Um, but here, he wants us to, to ask him. He wants us to seek him. And he gives us this wonderful picture of, and there's also an indictment in there, really, to say, you guys who are evil, and you want to do good things for your children, don't you? So how much more does your Father in Heaven want to take care of you? Just come to Him and ask. Right? Seek Him. And so prayer is also petition. God gives, and we ask. Right? He's the one who gives. We are the ones who come to Him and ask. Beverly observed last night with Eli. <laughs> Desperately. Boy, that kid was thirsty. All he wanted was water. That's all he wanted. Did I go get that water for him? No, I didn't. Me being evil, right? No. This was one of those moments where he knew what he needed to do. All he needed to simply do was go up to that kind young man standing at that register and say, may I please have a cup of water? <laughs> and so there was a little, you know, father-son lesson here. Like, you just got to go, you can do this. You can go right up there and ask him that. And he was just him and on. I just don't know about this. And he's like, I'll, I'll go later. <laughs> Not that thirsty, I guess. And then he came back a little bit later, and he was like, mm, uh, what do I do? And Beverly, Beverly played grandma. <laughs> she, she interceded on his behalf. Went and got him water. But I will tell you that later on that night, he was still thirsty, and he went and asked. <laughs> and he got, he got it, and he came back, and he enjoyed that cup of water. <clears throat> he learned how to ask, and learned that he could do it. He could boldly approach that cash register <laughs> and ask for a cup of water. We need to ask sometimes, right? And so just as a dad wants to teach their kids how to ask, but I know what you want, but I want you to ask. Uh, that, that same principle can play out in our relationship with the Lord. And so what a wonderful gift prayer is to us. We're not even close to beginning to understand. You know, well, we've got three more pages of this thing, and so we'll be going after this for a while. Um, but it's good, right, for us to understand what does the Word of God have to say about this amazing relationship that we can have with Him as we can literally go and converse with the Creator of the universe who cares for us. And so prayer is adoration, prayer is confession, prayer is communion, it's thanksgiving, and it's petition, and so next time we'll jump into supplication and intercession. All right? Let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time this evening. Lord, we praise your mighty name. Lord, you are worthy of all of our, all of our praise, Lord. You are worthy of glory and honor, you alone. And Father, I pray that we might give that to you, Lord. Uh, that we give it to you in our lives, Lord. And that's what we know you desire is for us to say, Lord, I'm yours. And so may we offer you our lives above all else. Uh, Father, move in the hearts of each of us here, Lord. Uh, lead and guide us, Lord, as we follow after you, we pray. And uh, Lord, just work in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Any other comments, questions? I suppose little Joshua's got some comments over there. Yeah. Hey, that's a sweet sound. It's all good. It's a sweet sound. He was screaming, we'd say, get out. <laughs> I know when I can say that. I have books for anybody that ordered books for the All right. <laughs> books for the ladies. Okay. Awesome. T-shirts are for sale, yes? Get your new t-shirt. You've got new a new design out there for the t-shirts. We've got the Exalt Equip Engage t-shirt. So. Sure. So, whopper, whopper. And you got ideas for two more? Okay, you know I love t-shirts. Okay.